Gary gave me the thumbs up, so that means that uh, we're ready to go. It's good to see uh, each one of you this morning, and here we are into a new year, and hope your resolutions are working out. Uh, I haven't made any this year, because they usually don't last long enough to make a difference. But one resolution we can make, and that's to be a better student of God's Word. I think that would be a, a wonderful thing to do, and uh, it, would, it would help us immensely. <clears throat> All right, th this morning we're going to be in 1 Corinthians. We're in chapter 2, the latter part of it, and hopefully we'll get into chapter 3. But last week I was asked a question. It was kind of a multiple question, and it had comments. I was asked the following at the end of Bible class last week in reference to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8. And the first part of the question, did God have an alternate plan ready in case the Jewish nation welcomed Jesus with open arms? Comments, comments were also made. Didn't Jesus have to be offered as a living sacrifice for our sins? And the second comment, God knows the hearts of mankind, so God knew that the Jewish nation would reject Jesus. <clears throat> and the second part of the question asked, so why did Paul, God by inference, because he inspired Paul, say the words he spoke in 1 Corinthians 2, 8? Let's uh, read that verse. 2, 8 says, none of the rulers of this age understood it for they had that if for if they had they would not have crucified the lord of glory <clears throat> you know it seems a little strange that you think of all the preparation throughout the old testament to say here he's coming he's coming when he came he said hmm we don't see him that was the problem for most of them but let's take a look and and the comments that that I had for verse 7. They were by Kaufman. He's a Bible commentator. He was a member of the church. He, he wrote uh, commentaries on all the books of the Bible. He said this, it is this mystery that's talked about here and we're introduced to, it is this mystery which dominates the 66 books of the Bible. God announced the mystery in Eden. Satan's part in it was revealed. The mystery deepened in the death of Abel. The mystery was progressively unfolded verbally in the Old Testament prophecies, systematically prefigured in the types and shadows of the Mosaic dispensation, explicitly heralded in the lives of great typical men of the Old Covenant, and came to a crisis on the cross of Christ, where in its great essentials it was fully unveiled. 
There are many corollaries of the central mystery, and the ultimate goal of it are projected into the future. A six-line summary of this great mystery is in 1 Timothy 3.16. We'll look at that shortly. <clears throat> and verse 8 says, One great essential element in the mystery is that of the incarnation of God in Christ. In other words, here comes Christ, become flesh, and we see God. I mean, here's a picture of God. We have a son, and together, always think, you know, if you'll see somebody and, and uh, you say, boy, they look familiar. Then you find out their family that they're from, and you say, looks just like their parents. I think that's what we get with Christ, this reflection of deity. And really, you think the total love from God was not recognized until Jesus showed up on the earth. This being the precise element of the <clears throat> mystery unknown to the rulers of this world, Christ made it clear that the Jewish religious hierarchy did indeed know who Christ was in a sense of knowing that he was the lawful heir of the temple, the promised Messiah, a holy and righteous prophet of God, and also the undisputed heir of the throne of David. What they did not know was that the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily. If you look at Col Colossians 2, uh, verses 9 and 10, and in Matthew 21, 38, there's a, a, a picture there, and what we find, maybe we'll all turn over here, Matthew 21, 38. And here's what it says. This has to do with, with Jesus and the parable of the evil farmers. And verse 38 says, But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Well, if that's not a picture of what happened with Jesus. We have all these pictures, these snapshots, all through the Bible of Jesus, what he's here for, and even the fulfillment. You know, if you had a picture, here's Calvary, here's Jesus hanging on the cross, fully unveiled, the mystery. The Jewish leaders under the figure of evil farmers said, this is the heir, come let us kill him and take his inheritance. Had the human wisdom of the world's leader been capable of recognizing God in Christ, they would not have crucified him. <clears throat> you know, we look back, and we've got the advantage of having it all, you might say. It's like Paul Harvey, the rest of the story. We've got it. They didn't have it then, so sometimes we're a little hard on these people. But the thing about it is, when Jesus revealed himself as who he was, there should have been no doubt. In their, in their minds. Now back to the first part of the question. Did God have an alternate plan ready in case the Jewish nation welcomed Jesus with open arms? Verse 7 says that God destined for our glory or redemption before time began. In other words, whatever we're going through, whatever we know about God, it was put in place before time began. When does it begin for us? In the beginning. We have no knowledge of anything past except what we see sometimes a little snapshot. This was all put in place before we were even created. <clears throat> How many plans were discussed by the Godhead? We do not know of any other work. We only have revealed the plan that we now know summed up in 1 Timothy 3.16. I think uh, in Timothy that's done really well. And let's take a look at uh, 3.16 in 1 Timothy. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, 
was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, and was taken up in glory. That's a complete sermon right there. <clears throat> and it kind of sums up uh, uh, everything about Paul and what he has to say. Now, the comment that was made, one of the comments, did Jesus have to be offered as a living sacrifice for our sin? Well, you know, throughout the Bible, sacrifice to God has been necessary. Let's look at Hebrews 13, verses 11 through 13, which provides a good answer, I think, for, uh, I, I think for the question. Hebrews 13, 11 through 13. <clears throat> the high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. So yes, that still was needed, and that was the last blood sacrifice that God was going to accept. Yes, Jesus had to be sacrificed because blood was required. Let's look at 1 John, verse 1 and 7. <clears throat> and it says, 1 John, verse, or chapter 1, verse 7, But if we walk in the light, as he, in the, he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. So we see the value of this this sacrifice. <clears throat> now, one other thing that goes along with this. How many times was the sacrifice of Jesus made? How many was the sacrifice made for? Let's go back to Hebrews once more. It's, it's really a good place to find some of these an answers. And if we look at Hebrews chapter 10, I'll read several verses. Maybe I'm answering this question with more information that's needed, but I, I feel like that I need to answer these questions to provide the best I can. Some of you already know the answer, but it helps us to review occasionally. Paul did that a lot. So Hebrews 10, chapter 10, verse 1 through 10. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming not the realities themselves. For this reason, it, it can never, by the same sacrifices, repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. Catch that once for all? But it didn't do it. Now, this is important. <clears throat> but those sacrifices are an animal, our annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared of me, for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first. He established the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ 
once for all. And if you catch this, he set aside the first to establish the second. See, the law all in the Old Testament, here we are under the, the law of Christ in the New Testament, and that's where we stand today. <clears throat> Comment two. God knows the hearts of mankind, so God knew that the Jewish nation would reject Jesus. That's true. Now, not only the Jewish nation, but the majority of the world still does today. This is something we always wonder about. Think about this. I know you've thought about this. Why did God do the things he did for mankind, knowing the outcome from beginning to end? Right? Don't tell me you've never thought about that. If he knows all this, why did he do these things? Well, I'm going to kind of sum it up in situations that we've all been in. I'm not sure it's the answer, but to me it helps make sense of why God just hangs in there with us. A family member or friend asks for something, usually money, and you know that family member or friend is going to use it for something that will, be, will not be good for them. Alcohol, gambling, drugs, or just poor spending choices. There will be a time when you say no, but many times you give them what they ask for, holding out hope for change in their life. Been there and done that? Anybody? The other side of the coin. Perhaps this is how God feels because he gave us free choice and he hopes we will make the best choice. And with God, there will be a time he will say no, and this world will come to an end. Something else to consider. We should be careful when discerning God and human understanding. I see that more and more today, especially in social media. It seems like people want to create God in their own image. And that's not the way it works. Let's take a look over in Acts 17, verses 29 through 31. <clears throat> Acts 17, verses 29 through 31. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked, I know some of the translations say winked, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. And of course we know who's being talked about there. I don't know if I answered the question completely, but <clears throat> I hope so. I answer it to the best of my ability. Like I say, when I study, you get my understanding of it. And it might not be a complete understanding, but I will say I've tried to spend the uh, time to, to give you a good answer. All right, let's uh, continue with the review of, of chapter 2. If we look at uh, chapter 2 and what we've found out so far, instead of depending on excellent speech or persuasive words of wisdom, Paul proclaimed Jesus and him crucified in verses 1 through 5. In verses 6 through 9, Paul proclaimed a type of wisdom that which comes from God. And then Paul ends the chapter, verse 16, with the words, but we have the mind of Christ. And this is where we'll begin before going into chapter 3. The mind of Christ, just what is that? Well, it's many things, and it's one thing. Precisely what is it to have the mind of Christ? There are a number of expressions in the New Testament which clearly have reference to the same condition. B. 
being in God, God's being in us, our being in Christ, Christ being in us, the Holy Spirit being in us, our being in the Holy Spirit, or our having the words of Christ dwell in us, and our having the mind of Christ in us, as here and also Philippians uh, chapter 2, verse 5. All are references to the safe condition, not to eight different conditions. And I think most of us realize that. It, it all just comes back to one. It's, it's like God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Separate but one. I remember I was telling somebody this last week. <clears throat> now, does Jesus know everything that God knows? I see something going like this, something going like this. There is one thing that Jesus and the angels don't know. I'll let you research it. And I'm sure there was divine wisdom that made it that way. <clears throat> there is a distinction, however, between the Christians of all ages having the mind of Christ and the fact of Paul and the other inspired teachers of the New Testament era having the mind of Christ as affirmed in this verse. It is a matter of degree, and they had plenary or complete power to preach God's word to mankind. The matter of degree summed up in Hebrews 2, 1 through 4. Let's go back over to Hebrews. A lot of information in Hebrews. 2, verses 1 through 4. And the thing, the subtitle of this is pretty good. Warning to pay attention. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. See, I, I, I've said this several times, and we need to keep this in mind. The the apostles and, and some others received what we call the miraculous measure of the Holy Spirit. They could do all these signs, wonders, and everything. And what was that for? It was to prove they were a messenger from God to do these things. Because they were all over nature, supernatural, you, you would call it. And I always say we get the ordinary measure, but... That ordinary measure works wonders in our lives when we allow the Spirit to, to work, work with us. Now, a closing note on this chapter. The whole trend and meaning of the chapter is that none could know or teach the Word of God by human wisdom. Today, all people are dependent for a knowledge of the will of God upon the revelation made by God's Spirit through the apostles and inspired teachers of that time. No man had any greater right than Paul to say, we have the mind of Christ. All right, four going three. Anybody got any comments on what's been said? You know you can. All right, chapter 3. Let's look at some objectives in studying this chapter. First of all, to see the proper place of preachers and teachers in relation to their work. And two, to appreciate God's view of the church as the temple of God. And a summary of this chapter would be, Paul continues to deal with the problem a division in this chapter. Its seriousness is seen in its carnality, which prevented Paul from being able to speak as to spiritually 
mature people. That might sound strange, but it'll unfold as we get into that chapter. To help them see the folly of exalting preachers over each other. Paul shows their relationship to one another and to their work, which is the building the temple of God. To the warning not to defile the temple of God, Paul adds, not to the glory and the wisdom of this world, nor in men. You know, here's another thing that, that and especially as time goes on, we feel like we've got all this knowledge. And that knowledge changes quickly as it comes about. And I think about this pandemic. How much information about that has changed over the last two years and continues to change? That's human knowledge. And if we go back in history, we'll see the things that, that really very intelligent people say that we should do, that we found out that that was not a practice that should have been done. So what we need to stand on is the wisdom of God. That's the only thing that is correct, right, and never changes. That doesn't mean we don't keep learning. In this world, we do. But we gotta remember, the only knowledge that you cannot fall or stands the test of time is the knowledge that God has provided. And we see that in all the books that God's provided. Let's take a look at verses one through four in chapter three. Or get back to chapter 3. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. <clears throat> I don't know if I would like being addressed like that to start with. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? You know, we look at this and and we can say, we can understand what's being said there, Paul, about not following somebody, but think about it. Does this happen today? Of course. And I'll give some examples. You know, a, a church will lose a preacher. They'll go someplace else that's close by. What happens with some of the members of the church? They follow that preacher. But who are we supposed to be following? Irregardless of that how good a minister they are, were to follow Christ. And we fall into these pitfalls that Paul's talking about. We think, well, this church there, and that was in bad shape. It's a snapshot of what goes on today. You fast forward a few hundred years, but it's the same. It's the human condition that Paul addresses. It's always the human condition never changes. Now when we look at, at uh, worldly or carnal Christians at Corinth, we find this in verse 1 and 2. And verse 1 got the expression brothers and sisters. Tempering the stern things he was about to say, Paul began with the word of loving affection. Brothers and sisters. Can you see that? You know, it's just like preachers come out and say, well, you know, we've got this, this problem going on here. But he says, brothers and sisters. That kind of sets the tone. He loves them. He cares for them. But he says, here's some things that's got to change. Spiritual versus 
worldly. The spiritual were those who, after conversion, had continued to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord, no longer continuing to be babes in Christ. The worldly or carnal were those who were continuing to live like the unconverted, full of envy, jealousy, and, jealousy and strife. Now we know as Christians, do we get a tinge of these things sometimes? Yeah. But the thing is, if we're mature Christians, we don't stay there. That's the difference. You know, it's, it, it's kind of like getting depressed. There are some people that, I mean, that depression is just something they can't overcome. But for most of us, as Christians, we might get depressed occasionally, but we don't stay there. That's the way with all these things. God knows they'll kind of enter in our lives sometimes. But if we're mature Christians, they won't stay there. That's the difference, I think. It talks about infants or babes in Christ. It is evident from the next verse that Paul did not blame them for being immature at the time of their conversion. Nevertheless, the expression as used by Paul was disapproving. Here, let's go back to Hebrews once more. I said a lot of good stuff in Hebrews that pertain to here. And we're going to look at ch chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. And a subtitle here would be Warning Against Falling Away. Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. Think about that statement. You no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. To me, we look at this and all Paul saying, to us, hey, the meat is right here, but you've got to take it each day. You can't depend on a Bible teacher or a preacher to feed you what you need completely for God. It depends on each of us. Now, what's nice about Bible classes and, and the preaching, the lessons come from Paul, it should make you think. The only thing is say, wait, wait a minute. Let me go take a look at this and see exactly what that says. Do we do that? You know, I think what helped me, <laughs> helped me get this mindset was preaching for 10 years. Because I'm telling you, you hear it all. <laughs> you can probably ask Rick about that. But you've got to grow. But each of you here are here for a reason. You want to hear God's word. And to me, that means you're wanting to grow. You're looking for the meat. Remember the commercial where the little old lady said, where's the beef? Well, here's the beef. <laughs> Verse 2. The milk is the first principles, elementary teachings. Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. Meat is more advanced learning. It is the symbol of preaching in which it is possible to unfold the full richness and magnificence of the gospel. Think about that, the gospel, and what all that entails. And then in verse 2, Paul says, you are still not ready. Now remember, he starts out because he says, brothers and sisters, because he loves them. He's going to tell them. 
you know, we've got problems here. You are still not ready. This describes a condition inexcusable. By now they should have grown up. It is expected of young Christians that they should be weak as babes. This having been true of the twelve themselves. We don't think about that. We thought all of a sudden all of them were full of knowledge. But you think about how Jesus brought them along and then the Holy Spirit finished the job with them. They had to grow too. They thought when Jesus was put in the tomb, it was all over. You go back and read back and see it. But when they discovered that he had risen, it changed them completely. That was a, a shot of growth within them. This having been true of the twelve themselves of whom Jesus said, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. John 16, 12. See, he knew where they were. There'll be a time when you're ready for it. But it's not right now. And don't you think, you see how we are when, when we first become a Christian. We're not probably ready for the red meat. But we should be brought along to that point. That's our job with a new Christian. Do we do that? How encouraging are we with new Christians? Now we get into a section, Evidence of the Christian's Worldliness. The Corinthian Christian's Worldliness. Verse 3 and 4. And they say, You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere humans? human beings. <clears throat> Verse 3, you are still worldly. Paul, by this word, did not deny that the Corinthians were Christians. They were still brothers and sisters. Remember verse 1? But their lives were marred by serious failures. Doesn't it sound like a lot of people today? Even Christians. You know, if we don't spend more time with God's Word and live what it says, we're in trouble. We're headed right where Paul's talking about the Corinthian church. Jealousy and quarreling or strife. These call to mind Paul's list of the works of the flesh. Wouldn't be a bad idea for us to take a look at that. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. And here's what we're told. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. I like that word, debauchery. It means a lot of things. Idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, all through Scripture, the human condition wants to, to fall back into not a good place. And you see repeatedly while God has His apostles leave the word of the things that we need to stay away from continually this is not the first time you will hear these things it continues because God knows human nature and where these exist the flesh rules had they been spiritual, they would have looked to Christ and would not have been partisans of men taking part in these kind of things.
Acting as mere humans means like ordinary, unconverted men and women. Verse 4, it is incorrect to suppose that Paul or Apollos encouraged or approved any such divisions, nor is there the slightest hint that any rivalry existed between them. Paul always spoke of Paulus with highest esteem and affection. And more is revealed in verse 5. Then when we get into verses 5 through 17, they concern the relation of preachers to their work. So let's read that. What after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe. <clears throat> Remember, they were a vessel that brought people to believe in Christ. Nothing else. That was their, their function. That's the way, what they were supposed to do. As the Lord assigned to each his task. I planted seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. You see how we're all involved in that? Some plant, some water. That's all of us doing these things, bringing people to Christ. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder or master builder. And someone else is building on it, but each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your minds? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person for God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. There's a lot said there <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to stop right there, and so we'll we'll start in in verse five next week. Does anybody got any comments? Well, it's good to cover everything without question. I know better than that. <laughs> All right, let's go to God in prayer. God, once again, we're thankful for being able to be here and stay for your word. And we thank you for those that may be listening. We, we ask that you touch all of our hearts and our minds and make us see things the way that you would want us to see things and therefore would make us better servants as we live this life. We realize that we're into a new year and help us just to be willing to look to you and make this year one that our service is indeed better. Help us that we might say something to someone who, who is seeking eternity and that we might be able to introduce eternity to them through your son Jesus. We realize that as we live this life, we have many blessings 
And we also endure the things that this life throws at us. There's health issues, there's family problems, there's all sorts of issues as we go through life. But we know when we turn to you and through your word, we're more able to handle these things. And when we can't, you're still there. Put your hand of comfort upon us. And we're so grateful for that. We ask that you be with those who are unable to be here for whatever reason, health or, or otherwise, and put a, a hand of comfort upon them and look after them. And continue to look after us and, and help us to continue to want to study your word and do those things that you would have us to do. You are good to us, dear God, and you bless us so richly. And we ask that you be with our nation as we go into this new year. Help the leaders turn to you for wisdom. Help the leaders of the world turn to you for wisdom. Help peace prevail, dear God, upon the earth. And we're thankful for all that you do. We thank you in your son Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. Let's sing together here to start. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings on earth. Tell me the story of Jesus, right on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious sweetest that ever was heard. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him, tell how he liveth again. Love in that story so tender, clearer than ever I see. Say, let me weep while you whisper, love pay the ransom for me. Tell me the story of Jesus, Write on my heart every word. Tell of the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Good morning. Good to see you. That was a really alert and a happy, joyful greeting and response. Thank you for that. Uh, it's, it's the new year. It's 2022, and I don't know about you, I can only speak for myself. I was getting ready this morning, and I told myself repeatedly, I said, now, i got to go get the check, and when I write my check out, I want to make sure I put down 2022. I don't want to be those people that make a mistake and don't, you know, i got to make that correct. And I reminded myself of that 10 different times, and then I couldn't find my checkbook. <laughs> so it's, it's one of those years, one of those days, one of those weeks, you know, the way things get started. Um, hopefully your day, your week, your year is off to a good start, and uh, what better way uh, to have an opportunity to gather together with church family uh, to worship God together. I'm glad that you're here, glad for those that uh, continue to tune in uh, faithfully and participate as they can from home, for those that have health concerns and other issues, maybe even some of our own who are traveling. Uh, thankful for uh, you being part of our assembly uh, this morning. Uh, thankful to have visitors with us, those that have come our way, and we'd invite you to come at any, uh, at any opportunity. Uh, I call attention, I see Doug down there. Glad, glad to see Doug, because Doug just celebrated a birthday. He's a New Year's guy when it comes to birthdays. So happy birthday, Doug. And uh, it's just good to, good to see and, and be together here this morning as we begin uh, our first worship assembly of 2022. And uh, we'll continue to worship God in song this morning.
good morning. If you're using a book and would like to, to mark the Song of Invitation, that will be number 389. 389. We'll begin this morning by singing number 700. Number 700. To the work. <clears throat> To the work, to the work, we are servants of God. Let us follow the path that our master has trod. With a balm of his counsel, our strength to renew. Let us do with our might what our hands find to do. Toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, toiling on. Let us hope, let us watch, and labor till the Master comes. To the work, to the work. Let the hungry be fed, let the fountain of life, let the weary be led. In the cross and its banner our glory shall be, while we herald the tidings, salvation is free. Toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, toiling on. Let us hope, let us watch, and labor till the Master comes. <clears throat> to the work, to the work, there is labor for all, for the kingdom of darkness and error shall fall. And the name of Jehovah exalted shall be in the loud swelling chorus, salvation is free, toiling on. Seven hundred eighty three. <laughs> if the name of the Savior is precious to you, if his care has been constant and tender and true. If the light of his presence has brightened your way, oh, will you not tell of your gladness today? Oh, will you not tell it today? Will you not tell it today? If the light of his presence has brightened your way, oh, will you not tell it If your faith in the Savior has brought its reward, if a strength you have found in the strength of your Lord, if the hope of a rest in his palace is sweet, oh, will you not, brother, the story repeat? Oh, will you not tell it today? Will you not tell it today? 
presence has brightened your way. Oh, will you not tell it today? If the souls all around you are living in sin, if the Master has told you to bid them come in, if the sweet invitation they never have heard, oh, will you not tell them the cheer-bringing word? Oh, will you not tell it today? Will you not tell it today? If the light of His presence has brightened your way, oh, will you not tell it? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. song, praising my Savior all the day long. Now before Aaron West Westfall comes to lead us in prayer, we'll sing number 225. 225. no treasures but perish with using however precious they be yet there's a country to which I am going heaven holds all to me heaven holds all to me, brighter its glory will be, joy without measure will be my 
Father in heaven, as we come here again on this first day of the week, that we can come together on this first Lord's Day of the new year, may our minds be focused on you here this morning, that we may focus on the total purpose that we are gathered here this morning, to be able to focus on, on you and everything that you have given to us, and focus on your son and your sacrifice that you gave to us, and may we also sing praises to you and give you all the glory and honor that's totally due to you. There are some here this morning that are unable to be here for you know their reasons, whether they be traveling or sick. May you be able to put your healing hand upon them and guiding hand upon them that they may reach their destination and get back to their portions of health to be your will. We ask you to be with those that are still suffering from illnesses around the world, COVID and other things, and natural disasters, especially here in our country from the recent tornadoes, that you may be able to be with those families that are struggling and be able to rebuild what they lost and be able to get back to some point of normalcy at some point. We ask you to continue to be with us as we're gathered here this morning that we may continue to always be focused on you and when we leave this place here later that we may be refreshed and be able to spread the good news of of your of your son and be able to share the gospel with those that need to hear it be with us and forgive us when we err in jesus name amen Now, before Jesse McKee comes to uh, lead us in our communion meditation as we surround the table to commune, uh, we'll sing number 299. 299, verses 1, 3, and 5. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. In pity angels beheld him and came from the world of light to comfort him in the sorrows he bore for my soul that night. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with a ransomed in glory His face I at last shall see T'will be my joy through the ages To sing of His love for me How marvelous, how wonderful and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. and Happy New Year. To help prepare our minds, I'd like to read, starting in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us were, were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin if we died with christ we believe that we will also live with him for we know that since christ was raised from the dead he cannot die again death no longer has mastery over him the death he died he died to sin once and for all but the life he lives he lives to god a new year doesn't that sound so promising a clean slate, a fresh start, a whole new year of potential. The idea of newness sometimes causes us to reflect on our past and to make new resolutions, to, do, to be different, to do something better, to do, to do more. Some want to be in better shape. Some want to be more adventurous. Uh, some want to learn something new be better organized, or, or be more creative. There's nothing wrong with those, uh, those desires or uh, making resolutions to, to achieve them. But we as Christians have a secret. We're already new. Excuse me. We can enjoy um, this powerful transformation every day. 
we've gone, undergone the most radical transformation possible. We've died and we're living a new life. All this is possible because of the sacrifice of Jesus. We surround this table each week to remember that sacrifice. It's hard not to reflect on the new life that we have because of this sacrifice. May we uh, never forget. May we resolve to be a better light. May we strive every day to be a positive influence for him. Would you bow for me, please? Heavenly Father, we come before you again giving you thanks. We're so thankful for the love that you have for us. We're so thankful for your mercy and your grace. We're so thankful for your son. We're thankful for the life that he lived. And help us to uh, strive to, to be imitators of his life. Help us to be intentional in the things that we do to glorify you, Father. And Father, as we uh, partake of this bread that re represents his body, Again, as we start this new year, help us to, again, reflect upon ways that we could be stronger and, 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 and be your hands and feet, Father. We just thank you so much and how you richly bless us every, every single day. Be with us as we uh, partake of this bread. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. bow with me again. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you again asking your blessing upon this cup. A cup that represents the blood that was shed, the blood that washes us free from sin. Father, again, we can't imagine the pain that Christ endured suffering on that cross. We're so thankful for that sacrifice and his willingness to give his life for the promise and the hope that we have to be with you in heaven one day. Father, help us again to approach every day as we know that we're not promised tomorrow uh, with the the newness and the profound and the excitement that we should have uh, again to be a light to to bring joy and and, and glory and, and hope and promise to others help others uh, when they're down and in trouble and need uh, and, and just to be be a good example and, and, and to be your hands and feet father we look forward so much to that day when you, when you come to take us all home. But until then, we, we just know that there's plenty of work to be done. Again, bless the, this cup and all of us as we partake and, and reflect upon that gift. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Elders have also set this time aside for us to have a prayer for the offering, which, again, has been left outside uh, of the doors uh, for us to do that. But would you bow with me for that, that prayer? Heavenly Father, we come before you giving you thanks. Thankful for all the blessings you give us uh, here on earth. Thankful for this wonderful body of believers and all the this nice facility and, and all the great things that we have we know all of these good things come from you. Uh, Father, we um, ask uh, a special blessing upon the offering that we, that we give. Uh, we ask also uh, to be over our elders as they steward us and guide us in the right, direct, in the right way to use these funds and help us to uh, 
put them to good use to, again, always be a light and, and uh, to be your hands and feet. Uh, we just thank you so much for all that you do for us and all this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before the reading and the message of the hour, we'll sing together number 687. 687, verses 1, 2, and 4. 1, 2, and 4. so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know thus saith the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood just in simple faith to plunge me neath a healing cleansing flood jesus jesus how i trust him how i proved him more and more jesus jesus Precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust thee. Precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that thou art with me. Wilt be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Today's reading will be from the book of Acts, chapter 22, verses 12 through 16. Acts 22, 12 through 16. And this is a portion of Paul's testimony when he was arrested in Jerusalem, when he addressed the crowd as he's been taken off to prison concerning his uh, conversion. And this is the part jumps in after he talks about being blinded on the, uh, on the way to Damascus. And it begins, A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people and what you have seen and heard. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. I might encourage you to turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. 
may already have your Bibles open in Acts, but just flip back to Acts chapter 9 here this morning. I do hope that your year is off to a good start. I hope that, uh, you know, I've, I've observed a little bit while we say Happy New Year for the last couple of years have been challenging, certainly. No one can object to that. And it's caused people to be maybe a little more pessimistic about what the future may hold. I hope that you look forward to this year and you think about the opportunities that are before you, before us as a church family, uh, that you uh, anticipate that uh, God does not change. God was good to us before. He's going to be good to us in 2022, be good to us in the future. Uh, we are certainly blessed, and let's not lose sight of that. I told you last week that we would look, um, last week we talked a little bit more about in Acts chapter 8, Philip, as he approached the, the eunuch, and I said, you know, God continually used people to bring about a uh, change in lives, to, to bring about uh, sending the message of his son Jesus. And I mentioned that this week we look on the other end and see those on the, the receiving end, one in particular in Acts chapter 9 is Saul. Um, you know, Saul would later become the Apostle Paul. Like I said, most of you probably are familiar with that. It might slip and I might actually call him Paul yet, but his name hadn't, uh, hadn't changed in Scripture. But in Acts chapter 9, you'll remember that we first learned about Saul when... Uh, you know, Stephen had lost his life, and there was Saul kind of overseeing, giving approval to Stephen's death. And at the beginning of Acts chapter 9, right from the very beginning, we find that Saul is causing a lot of damage. It says that Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. So that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. I've seen some that have speculated. Maybe he, you know, some may have fled and gone toward Damascus from, from Jerusalem. And he was going to go and try to bring them back. And, and some have debated whether that's the actual case here or not. But what we do know is, is now as he went on his way, here comes Saul and he's, he's ready to do all kinds of damage. He's got these letters in hand. He's got the authority, the ability, the enthusiasm to carry out his mission, to kind of stop this message of the risen Lord from being preached, being talked about. But as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly there was a light from heaven that shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you? Lord. And he said, I am I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and for three days he was without sight. And he neither ate nor he drank. What a, already kind of a, a remarkable story. And one of the things that strikes me as a little bit curious is if you go through the, the conversions, you go through the accounts uh, here in Acts where you see people who becoming Christians, becoming disciples of Jesus. Oftentimes you see individuals who are seeking Jesus out, right? Philip was brought to the eunuch's side and he was already, the eunuch already had his his nose in the scriptures, trying to decipher and determine for himself what he should do. There are times throughout the book of Acts that you'll find individuals who, such as in Acts chapter 2 that we've already looked at, are going forward, it would say people would ask, you know, what can we do? We realize that we've done wrong. What should we do differently? And it was at that moment they were presented a message of hope, a message of salvation through the gospel of Jesus Christ. But here, this was an unusual set of circumstances because Saul wasn't seeking Jesus out. In fact, he was seeking an end to Jesus. He was seeking an end to these things that had been talked about, thinking he was doing what, what needed to be done, willing again to carry out this, this devious plan. And boy, he was, gonna, he was wreaking havoc and causing a lot of fear. You know, and so what's interesting, so he approaches Damascus, and boy, he's, he is confident in what he's about to do. I don't know, maybe he, maybe he had his chest puffed out a little bit. 
You know, he's going to come in there not shy, not bashful uh, about what he hoped to accomplish. But there was an intervention that took place. God intervened, the Lord intervened through this bright light, through this voice, through this conversation, through this dialogue. And Saul was immediately humbled, right? No, no more could, could he even walk in on his, own, on his own account. He was suddenly blinded to the point where he had to be led in by the hand. What a, what a humbling experience for a man who um, had it all together, who, whose focus, he, he, had, he had intent, he had desire and willingness to carry out his plan. Nothing was going to get in his way. But the Lord stepped in. And again, while he hadn't sought the Lord out, he, he wasn't looking for Jesus. That's who confronted him. And again, that question comes out, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he asks, recognizing there is some greater power here. Who are you, Lord? And he hears the words, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. And, and I don't know what, what feelings must have taken place, what that must have done to the heart and mind and soul of this man. But there certainly was a change being made. And, and maybe that's the only explanation that can be let, made is, is, is when he goes into Damascus and then he remains there and for three days without sight, neither eating or drinking. But I bet you he did a lot of thinking. But there was a lot of meditation that was taking place. A lot of thoughts about what he was trying to do. But, but a lot of thoughts about the moments that he had on this path to Damascus. And what his future might hold. Verse 10 suddenly kind of jumps to a different location. There in Damascus was a disciple named Ananias. And it says the Lord speaks to him in a vision. And says Ananias. Ananias replies here I am Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in the vision that a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes. He regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. Now there are several, uh, I guess several lessons, several little things that could be pulled uh, from this section that would be beneficial to us. One, a reminder about God using people. Uh, as I said before, that's always been God's plan. God could have spoken these words himself. Jesus could have confronted Saul on that road and said, you know, here's what you need to do. But instead, I, I want you to go and wait. Maybe again to give Saul the opportunity to think about all that he had done, all that he was going to do. Maybe to reflect on some of that. But God saw fit to use Ananias, you know, even as much as he gave him a message to deliver to Paul that, that Paul, or Saul at that point, was going to be a chosen instrument. It's interesting to me that Ananias was an instrument, a chosen instrument to deliver this message to Saul. That would change the course of history. You know, one of the things, it's, it's interesting again to think that these are events that actually happened. These are people that walked on the face of the earth. And again, to think about what was going forward, we know the conversion, we know Saul's transformation into becoming Paul, the New Testament apostle, the one who was responsible for so many written words in the scriptures that we have at our fingertips. God had turned things around, even the intervention that took place on the road to Damascus, consider how many lives may have been saved because of God's action. Now Saul was heading to Damascus to, to uh, 
uh, bind people up, but the threats and the, and the things that he had said would lead to believe he wasn't opposed to, to doing away and, and killing people. He had already overseen and been present when Stephen was killed. And so again, God stepped in, which saved people's lives and, and now transformed uh, Saul's heart to be a person who was going to save people's lives through the message of Jesus. So we can see Ananias being the chosen instrument. And, and, and again, even though he expressed apprehension because Saul had a, a reputation, right? Word had already gotten to Ananias and I'm sure to anybody else in the area that, hey, watch out for this gentleman. And, and again, steer clear of him. He means trouble. And, and they even knew that he had a plan in place that he comes with the support of the chief priest to do all these things. But upon the reassurance that Ananias was giving, just as Philip had the same thing happen before that we looked at, boy, there was no hesitation. It was the, re there was the response that was oh, obedience to what he was called to do. We could spend some time looking at Acts chapter 9, looking at these other conversions, and, and making sure that we understood the importance of responding the way the Bible speaks about responding, right? When Saul receives this message, the very first thing that he does is, is he rises up and he's baptized, right? And, and we know from the, the eunuch and we know from other examples that, again, baptism was a central point of that process, of that conversion point. And, and it's not something that we should shy away from. And it's something that a lot of folks will tend to, to, to deliver a message that's contradictory to things that are found in the Bible. Those who might say, you know what, hey, you, you can be saved whenever you want and get baptized later on take care of that at some more convenient time we'll get together and have a special baptism day oh, you've heard and seen that before doesn't match up with anything that we find that took place here in the new testament that took place from all the examples that were given here we see that saul was going to be a changed individual he begins certainly at that point the verses that follow that, that come right after that he immediately begins to proclaim that jesus is the son of god he, he doesn't even take time to to think about you know his, his message changed he, he began to turn the world upside down and in fact one of the things that i want to make sure that we understand josh already alluded to we read just a moment ago from acts chapter 22 because uh, Saul tells, it gives another account of, of what happened to him. And that's not the only time in Acts chapter 26, the same thing comes about. Where, where Saul finds himself uh, kind of, you know, being held captive, held prisoner, and telling his story. And you know, that's what I want to focus on here this morning. I want us to consider, I was saying the song earlier, tell me the story of Jesus. Doing so intentionally, and, and as often the case, Dennis looked in some songs, and I didn't coordinate with him, but the songs just fit so well. Because I like that we sang songs where, where we proclaimed and, and we sang to God, this is my story. This is my song. We, we sang about how, you know, will you not tell it today? In thinking about bringing that message to other people. I, I want to encourage you to tell the story of Jesus. You know, that, that first hymn that we saw, you know, kind of started with the birth of Jesus and then and put Jesus on the cross. And we've kind of gone through a time where, where much of the world thought about the birth story of Jesus. We as Christians acknowledge that, you know, we, we want to be about thinking and, and telling the story of Jesus on the cross, his, his death, death, burial, and resurrection. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. I want you to tell the story of Jesus. And I'll change that slightly. I want you to tell your story of Jesus. That doesn't change Jesus. That doesn't change who he is. That doesn't change him being the son of God. See, Saul wasn't bashful. Saul, Saul wasn't shy. He, he didn't back away from an opportunity to tell people about Jesus being the son of God. And he relayed to anybody that he had an opportunity to do so, to tell them about his interaction with Jesus. What about you? What about me? Right? If there's one thing that I can encourage you to do today is to leave this place convicted and committed to telling the story of Jesus, to telling your story of Jesus. 
and how you encountered the Lord and how that changed your life. I'm going to share something with you. And this, oh, this may step on some toes. I'm going to give you a head, heads up. Some of you already, are, you're feeling it, right? If you look back to the year 2021, some of you don't want to talk about that. Sorry, I'm going to bring it up. In 2021, there are many Christians who talked more in 2021 about Betty White than they did about Jesus Christ. I love Betty White. Who doesn't love Betty White, right? She made the news. It was big time because she was almost 100 years old. She passed away just before the new year. And boy, everybody I knew was talking about Betty White. Some of you, are, it's real personal. You've got a dog at home named Betty and you watch the Golden Girls every afternoon. And, and it's, this is kind of getting harsh, right? You know, hey, I love Betty White. But again, I, the, the world was talking about Betty White. And I couldn't help but think, you know what? We can talk about Betty White or we can, and hey, listen, let's, I, I'll make sure it's hit close to home, right? I can talk about sports. I can talk about, uh, we can talk about politics. We can talk about COVID. We don't like to do that anymore, right? We got all these things that we talk about. We got subjects that we're knowledgeable about and, and we share these things all the time. We have things, we oftentimes talk about things we have, really don't know about. True, isn't it, right? Hey, let, let, we won't make it so personal. Don't, do you know other people who talk about things they really have no clue about? I bet you do, right? The world's talking all the time. But how often do we talk about Jesus? You know, uh, and maybe, maybe, we, maybe we don't do that enough even within the, the walls of the church building. And certainly we have Bible class. In, but let's, let's get to talking more about Jesus and the difference that he has made in our lives. Let's get to talking more about Jesus and the difference he can make in the lives of other people. Surely we, we don't back away from that opportunity because we don't think he can make a difference. I don't think there's anybody here who would say that. Maybe that's a good or healthy reminder for us to be reminded that Jesus can make a difference in the lives of people. He makes a difference in my life and your life. I hope that that you know, is, is worthy again of, of being recommitted in your mind to. And that you'll again leave this place committed to that. Maybe that's something that, that, you know, as we come together this morning, that you can be uh, a New Year's resolution, right? Those things that some of you have already messed up. I know it's, it's January 2nd and you've already failed whatever you plan to do, right? Let, let's get back, on, let's get back on, on track. You know, if you find yourself, again, if I've stepped on your toes and have stepped on mine, you think, you know, I've, I've done a lot more talking about lots of different things, not enough talking about Jesus. Let's begin anew today you know, and, and, and take advantage of opportunities. And I think, again, the world is ready for the message of Jesus Christ. The world needs it. They need a message of hope. And we're the ones that are capable of delivering it. There's something else of interest in, in Paul's, uh, again, Saul's story. From Acts chapter 9 to Acts chapter 22 to Acts chapter 26, uh, they're, they're identical accounts, but they do give a little bit extra details. They complement one another. If you turn over in your Bibles to Acts chapter 26, um, the translation that I use, it's interesting because Paul, again, I keep saying it, in Acts chapter 26, he actually was referred to Paul at that point. And Paul, as he shares this story again about going to Damascus, he has a little bit of a nugget here that I think is of interest and worth calling attention to today. In verse 14, Acts 26, he says, And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are, are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you? Lord, and the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, you, you probably already recognize the difference. Uh, there was that extra statement about kicking against the goads. Now, there's probably some of you in Acts chapter 9, that, that phrase is actually included if you're reading from like a King James or a New King James translation. It's still there. You know, it's, it's inserted there in Acts chapter 9. But for a lot of your Bibles today, if you're looking at following along, it wasn't there. I think it was in Acts chapter uh, chapter 9, 
but it was in verse 5 that that would have been there. Maybe you think to yourself, well, that's a good reason it's not there because I don't know what that's talking about. Let's take a moment and look at that. To kick against the goads, my understanding, well, I don't know if I've ever seen a goad up close or held one, but kind of an instrument with kind of a, a metal into it used to, to guide animals, right? To kind of prompt them to get a move on. My understanding, again, that, that expression would kind of describe these animals when, when those goads were used. They didn't care for it, right? You wouldn't want something to be poked and prodded with anything. And so these animals would kind of instinctively kick against those things, kind of uh, resisting those things. Well, even doing so wasn't something that was very comfortable to do, kind of a scene that maybe you can kind of get this visual image. And so when Paul refers in Acts chapter 26 about this statement that was made and, and, and says that, you know, it was spoken to him that it's hard for you to kick against the goads. Maybe that, that adds a little bit of light to um, what went on through Paul's mind and, and the statement that was made in, in resisting maybe what he knew he needed to do. Maybe there's somebody here this morning that can really relate to that. You know, maybe uh, you, you've known for a while of some changes in your life that you need to make, that you, uh, you know, a resolution that you should have made a long time ago. Not just saved it for a new year, but you've not taken care of things. And I would hope, what, what other opportunity, you know, whether it's, a, whether it's New Year's when it seems like the perfect time for everybody to make commitments, whether it's at the first Sunday of the year that, that you're here today and, and maybe recommitted in your walk, your spiritual walk, to, to be faithful to God in all things, these are all great but again, if there is something holding you back, I love the fact that God knew Saul's heart. Yeah, he, he knew that Saul intended to do so much damage, so much uh, harm to his people, to, to the body of Christians, to church, to disciples. He was going to go in and, and do what he could to disrupt everything that was taking place. But I think what God saw in Saul was, boy, if I can turn him around he's going to be just the one I need this chosen instrument to carry out this message he's going to be able to do some things that no one else is capable of doing take comfort friends this morning and that God knows your heart God knows the things that you're struggling with he knows the things that have been weighing you down that you've been burdened with the, the things that made it hard to be here this morning, the things that make it hard sometimes. Do, I've known Christians who sometimes tell me that, boy, I, we, we sing and worship and I have a hard time singing because I, can't, I don't feel the words or I, I'm struggling with something. God knows. God knows the things that, that are uh, causing you difficulty. And maybe that expression about kicking against the goads that you found yourself kind of trying to resist and, and putting off the things that need to be done for far too long. Can I encourage you to, to fix that, to take care of that, if that be your issue this evening or this morning? I want you to think about Acts chapter 9. Think about uh, Saul's story. And again, as I said before, I want you to think about your own story. What I love about it is, is probably going around, if we had opportunity this morning, to speak out about all these things, everyone's story is probably a little different. I'd love to hear your story. You got a real interesting story, I want you to stop me before you leave this morning or, or schedule a time and I'll come by your house so I can hear your story. I'd love to know it. Be committed to telling your story to other people today, this week, this year. Again, not backing away from opportunities to talk about Jesus. Or again, maybe there's something in your life that you need to take care of and, and you've put off for far too long. Today's the day. Today's the day to make your life right with God. If you have sin in your life that needs to be pushed aside, thrown off. If you have things, that the relationships that are just so broken that you don't know where to turn, maybe you need the help of Christians here to pray for you in that regard. You've got stuff that you're facing that maybe you feel like you're all alone. I've oftentimes found that's usually never the case. There are likely others struggling with similar difficulties. 
And maybe there's a source of encouragement found within our church family here. But again, maybe the prayers and concern and love uh, of, of this family of Christians could be of help today. If you have a need this morning that we can address, we want to help you. Would you come now while we stand and while we sing together? Would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good? Would you walk with him within the narrow road? Would you have him bear your burden, carry all your load? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see. T'was best for him to have his way with thee. Would you have him make you free and follow at his call? Would you know the peace that comes by giving all? Would you have him save you so that you need never fall? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see t'was best for him to have his way with thee. Would you in his kingdom find a place of constant rest? Would you prove him true each providential test? Would you in his service labor always at your best? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see t'was best. For him to have his way with thee. Please be seated. Good morning. The teen um, party was scheduled for Friday evening, has been canceled due to the increase in the virus, and hopefully that will be rescheduled. Um, the elders are in full support of the breakout sessions, but they have been postponed until further notice due to COVID. But we will, I know some are beginning to wonder, but we will have those uh, that new thing um, uh, someday uh, we just need to pray for that day to come uh, to our church family thank you for the flowers, cards, visits and prayers for our 60th anniversary John and Roberta Crane uh, Susan Fry tested positive for COVID and Mike Fry gets his results tomorrow so we need to, of course, pray for them. Uh, most of the, the sick are uh, in the bulletin, and there's really not been a whole lot of change. Uh, so you need to refer to your bulletin to uh, um, get updated on that. Also, we need to pray for our shut-ins and many other family and friends on our prayer list and of those of our congregation that are dealing with COVID and cancer. If you'll bow with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, 
we come to you this morning blessed that we could be here, that we could go and worship you. And we just ask that our worship was um, in spirit and in truth. We just ask that um, you be with us, help us to go and when uh, there are things that need to be done, when there are things that you want to use us for, that we will step up and that we will we will help people, we'll show uh, this community how much we love you and, and that you're our Savior. We're thankful for this church, this congregation here. We're thankful that they could go and uh, uh, they're faithful. We ask that you increase our faith, that you help us to go and, and uh, uh, be there for each other. Uh, let us edify and build each other up that we may uh, face um, each trial or ten things that are on our mind, things that are uh, that we go and uh, uh, struggle with. Help us to go and, and seize those opportunities and talk to the person or help them in any way we can. We ask that you be with the sick. Uh, we have several that have uh, either has cancer or uh, had treatment for cancer. And uh, we think especially at this time of Terry that he's going through. And we just ask that you uh, put your healing hands upon him and be with Pauline as she's there to, to take care of him, give her strength that she needs. And there's many others that are on her mind. We know that there's several that are shut in that can't get out. So help us in some way. Uh, burden, help them with the, the burden that they have. The, uh, they're there all day like in the nursing home and, and uh, it's a long day when all you do is you can sit and that's about all you can do. We ask that you bless them. Help us to go and, and bless them and to help them through that. Help us to go and be uh, faithful Christians. Help us to go and love one another, especially and love you. Because your love is so great, you sent your son to die upon that cross. That his blood washes away our sins. Help us to have that kind of love for each other. Help us to go and always go and, and uh, talk with one another if we have a problem. And help us to go and, and solve those problems. We ask you to forgive us of our sins. We make those even if we try not to. We know that we try hard, but the devil is uh, ever so resilient. He, keeps, he just keeps on at us. So we ask that you help us and give us strength to go and, and uh, with our sins, go, help us to go. And, but we ask for forgiveness because we know that you will forgive us. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.